Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. I made a phone call to a friend of mine who I knew was a hitman. I left a message on his answering machine. Obviously, I didn't say I want you to come and kill someone. I said, I need you to come. But anyhow, about 24 hours later, he turned up at my house and he was a different person, you know. he, Yeah, he was preaching the gospel. And like I called him to kill someone. And he, instead of coming with a 9 mil pistol, he came with an NIV Bible and he was on fire for Jesus. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, David Harris grew up in South Australia and after his parents separated, his life began a downward spiral into prison cells, mental asylums and frightening experiences with the occult. Today, David will share his life journey, which he has written about in his book called Certified. And before we begin, I just want to let parents know that some of the issues that will be talked about today are not appropriate for younger listeners. Now, here's David Harris having a chat with Eric Scatterbo from his home in Bendigo, Victoria. Welcome to the program, David Harris. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you with us. And let's start off from the beginning before the downward spiral began in your life. You had a pretty pleasant, happy childhood in South Australia. Yeah, it was great. I remember we had uh, speedboats and sailing boats. And um, often on the weekends, we'd enjoy water skiing and sailing and you know, was, it, we had a, I had a great childhood and until um, my mother and father separated and um, things went a bit pear-shaped after that. I remember at grade five being in school and just sobbing uncontrollably, mm. you know, and, and not really knowing why, not really being able to articulate it as a, as a young person, but realising that my heart was um, broken mm. at, at, because of my father um, leaving and my mother and father that you know, the stress and the, and the problems they had in their relationship just really affected me as a, as a young boy. Okay, help us understand then what happened. Where did it go after your heart was really broken from your parents yeah, separating? Well, I, I, we were living in South Australia, and when, when my um, father left, we moved to Ballarat in Victoria. Mm-hmm. And in Ballarat, I um, started a life of rebellion, really, mm-hmm. my, I had a lot of rejection and pain in my heart, like I said. And um, for example, I went at high school. There was a school magazine, and in the magazine, I was um, pictured at the front of the principal's office with a chair with my name written on it because I was always in the principal's office. Oh, I was wow. always in always in trouble. Um, you know, I was bullied at school at mm. high school. I got beat up, and I didn't really know how to fight. I didn't have anyone to teach me how to fight, so I learned taekwondo and i learned how to fight i learned how to defend myself and yeah i found a bit of identity in that and then i started drinking alcohol at a fairly young age Mm -hmm. going down the streets and getting into fights and yeah i got in a lot of trouble a lot of rebellion and uh, finally ended up uh, my mother couldn't control me and i ended up going to live with my father in wollongong in new south wales okay so then moved to new south wales how did that go yeah, no, um, yeah, that was, that was, um, he got me a job in a, in a service station. Mm-hmm. I was probably 16, nearly 17 by that stage. And, um, I, I worked with a couple of guys there and they were actually, um, ripping people off. In New South Wales, you need a, well, at that time, you needed a roadworthy certificate, um, to get your car registered. Mm-hmm. And people would come in to get roadworthies and we would tell them that things were wrong with their cars that weren't wrong with their cars and, we pretend to fix them, and then we would charge them um, a lot of money, and I was part of that. And um, I, I thought, well, they were robbing people, so I started stealing from them. I started stealing from the till, mm. and I justified it because I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. Mm. Another example of the downward spiral as it just kind of starts to escalate as it goes downward. Yeah, that's right. I learned to steal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're then you wrong. joined the army. Yeah, I did. At, at 17 years old, I joined the army and I really became a fully fledged alcoholic, I believe, in the army. I, I guess I found some identity and acceptance in alcohol and it helped take away my, my um, pain. Mm-hmm. And I used to um, challenge people to drinking competitions and, you know, take a bit of pride in being able to drink them under the table. Hmm. Yeah. So that was uh, kind of how you got acceptance in the army. Yeah, it is. It's how I got acceptance, and 
yeah, found um, that I could get a bit of victory in my life, I guess. Mm. Pretty sad, really. Yeah. And then yeah. you were injured? Yeah, I was. I um, I twisted my ankle um, on an exercise, and um, whenever I went out on exercise, I found that it would reoccur, the injury, and then I felt inadequate as a result of that. I just felt like I, I, could, I wasn't up for the mark, and eventually I um, ran away from the army. I went AWOL. And after three months on the run, I got a discharge from the army. And back then, if you stayed away for three months, mm -hmm. they would give you a discharge. But if you got caught within that three months, they would um, take you back into the army and put you into an army prison. I wasn't too keen on going into an army prison, so I managed to hide for three months. And after that time, I was living in Ballarat with my mother and my grandmother. And I, then I started using heavier drugs. So this kind of began a trend in your life of uh, running away from problems. Yeah, you're not wrong. Mm. Yeah, I found myself running a lot, running and hiding and trying to escape reality with drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the first time I had speed. Um, mm -hmm. I actually really, really enjoyed the rush of it. I found it was very addictive for me, and that, that caused me to um, have to do uh, greater crimes to make money. You know, I, I needed to support the drug habit, so I do robberies and and um, and then I was, found myself facing prison, and it, that caused me to go on the run again. Mm. This time, I ended up in Western Australia with my cousin and his girlfriend. And how did that go? <sighs> yeah, that was that was a nightmare. That's um, I was actually. I remember when we first arrived there, I was just turning um, 21. We were in a caravan park in Fremantle, and uh, we met some guys there um, who had a caravan, and I was at their caravan. I was um, drinking whiskey and smoking marijuana, and I got so out of it that I couldn't even walk, and I had to crawl back to the tent where we were staying in this little tent. Um, yeah, it's not a very good way to see 21 in, that's for sure. It was, it was shocking. Yeah, but then we ended up um, getting a house in Western Australia and ended up doing a lot of robberies um, to support alcohol and drug habits. And mm. But also, at that time, ended up getting involved in the occult. So you were just into the drugs, and of course, as you mentioned, the crime was to support doing the drugs. But then out of the blue, you just said, hey, let's experiment with a, a Ouija board. Is that how it started, the occult? Yeah, we just had this idea. Let's mm -hmm. experiment with yeah. a Ouija board. Yeah, just out of the blue. Yeah, it was pretty weird. We'd never done it before. And we, so we set it up. We we made a Ouija board and we set it up. And to our surprise, it actually worked. Mm. And yeah, it was pretty crazy time, really. So we started with the board. And in the end, we didn't need the board because the, the spirit would go straight into my friend's girlfriend, my cousin's girlfriend, and speak through her. And it was quite scary the first time because it came out in a male's voice. It wasn't a female's oh, voice. Oh, wow. Was, yeah, yeah. So here you just thought it was just a bit of fun, but you didn't really realize at that time you were dabbling in demonic spiritual things. No, no, because the, the spirit, he was a liar and he told us he was in heaven and all these different lies. And mm. in the end, we realized that he was lying and... You know, that house became a quite a horrible environment. There was a lot of stuff going on there, uh, really dark stuff. And um, it, it did not end well not at all. I, like, I would never recommend anyone to get involved in that stuff because mm -hmm. it will bring you a lot of grief, a lot of pain. It certainly brought me a lot of grief and a lot of pain. You're listening to The Story. Today, Eric Scadabo is chatting with David Harris, who's the author of the book Certified, about his downward spiral into prison cells, mental asylums, and frightening experiences with the occult. But as we'll hear, there's much more to David's story. Next, we'll hear the incredibly unique way that God enters into his life. All that and more when we return. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax and this is The Story. We're continuing with Eric Scadabo chatting with David Harris, who's the author of the book Certified, about his downward spiral into drug addiction and a life of crime. 
Now we're going to hear what happened next in his life after the police arrived. Well, eventually, the uh, one morning at dawn, the police came and I was in bed, obviously, and I woke up and the police were in my bedroom. Before I knew it, I was on my face and I had um, handcuffs on and I was taken to the police station. I was charged with several burglaries and ended up um, in prison in a prison called Cannibal Remand Centre in Western Australia, Mm -hmm. which was quite a nice prison, really. Um, Quite modern, um, had your own cell with your own key to your cell, shower, colour TV. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really nice. There was a gym, tennis courts, got quite fit, got off the drugs. Um, I felt quite good for a little while. But then the voices came and, um, you know, I got tormented and... um, yeah, you know, I had a whole lot of grief because of the occult stuff that I'd been involved in. So you started hearing voices in your head? Yeah, I certainly did. They were like thoughts, but they weren't my thoughts. Mm. You know, they came hard, fast, and continuously. Um, you know, negative thoughts like, kill yourself, come on, join us. You know, I remember one time walking into my cell, and like I said, I had a key to my cell, and my cousin, he was across the corridor in, in a cell behind me. And I opened my cell door and I walked into my cell and I walked over to my bed and then a razor blade appeared on my bed and I grabbed the razor blade and I I went to the toilet and I heard these voices in my head saying at the same time, come on, join us. I went to the toilet and I put the razor blade in the toilet and I flushed it and I said, no way, I'm not doing that. And I walked back towards my bed and my cousin walked into my cell at the same time and another razor blade appeared on the floor uh, before both of us. And I told him about the first one. I went to the toilet and it was actually still there. So pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, you eventually did attempt suicide by self-harm? Yeah, I did. I I certainly did. And I remember um, I'd gone from that prison. I was in Fremantle Prison at the time. And um, the next thing I I remember is I woke up and I was chained to a bed in hospital um, because I'd done myself some real harm. Mm. And... Yeah, that was crazy. When I, but when I woke up, it was interesting because there, uh, there was a, a prison officer there and he was a Christian. And I, I was able to share with him some of the things that were happening. And he said, yeah, he agreed that, that the spirit realm was real and that I was in a spiritual battle, which was really cool the way God set that up. Yeah, because nobody could understand what you were going through before that? No, I felt very um, alone and isolated. And, you know, I tried to explain to people what was going on but not many people really had a grid for the spirit realm Mm -hmm. Uh, they just thought i was um schizophrenic oh okay yeah yeah and so they thought it was just a mental illness but this christian who you met there actually said no this is uh happening on a spiritual level on a demonic level is that kind of what he said yeah he did yeah he he said um the bible talks about this so it really sowed a seed in my heart at the time because I obviously didn't know God. I didn't mm. really have a grid for God at all, to be honest. Yeah. But from there, I ended up in a place called Greylands, which is a psych center in Western Australia. And that was, um, yeah, that was pretty full on. That's where I went from the hospital straight to that place. And I was bombarded with voices in my head and I was like tormented by those spirits. And that, as a result, they, um, they sedated me, like, they gave me heaps of major tranquilizers. I was, I was uh, walking around, but, you know, the lights were on, but no one was home. Hmm. I, was, I was gone. It was like a chemical lobotomy. Hmm. So you're yeah. kind of walking around like a zombie. Yeah, I was. Yeah, 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 yeah it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And then uh, when that didn't work, they ended up giving me shock treatment, electric shock treatment. I had that about six times, and you know, they'd take me and they'd sedate me, they'd knock me out, and then... Um, put these electrodes on my head and wow. shock me, and then you know then I'd wake up and I'd just have a massive headache and memory loss, and yeah, unfortunately that didn't really cure me either. Yeah, I was going to say, did any of that help? Well, you know, maybe maybe it probably kept me alive, but I don't think it, it certainly didn't heal me. But mm. you know, it probably saved my life in some ways, physically, but but didn't restore my life to normal, you know. And then you were diagnosed with schizophrenia? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and um, given drugs. And and I eventually went back to Fremantle Prison 
And then from Fremantle Prison, I was transferred back to Victoria, uh, to Pentry's Prison. And how did that go? Yeah, it was okay for a while. Um, I was doing okay there in Pentry's Prison, but then uh, the voices came back and I was tormented and I ended up eventually in a place called Jaywood Ararat. Oh, what is that? Uh, that was a place for the criminally insane in Victoria. Now it's it's a museum now in Victoria, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, it was it was the worst place I've ever been in. It was the end of the line for the most uh, violent, criminally insane people in Victoria in that place. And you know, here I was. I was like 24 years old, and I found myself in there. I thought, how did I get here? Wow. But yeah, yeah, I was there. <laughs> I'll tell you about my first night in Jaywood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I arrived there, and I was put into a cell. And uh, there was a guy in the cell next to me banging on his door. He just kept banging and banging and banging. And I, look, I was sedated, and I just wanted to go to sleep. And I was saying to him, ah, be quiet. Just be quiet. Well, you're saying a bit more than that, actually, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was not responding to me and we had quite an argument you know that mm-hmm. night and i woke up the next morning all the cell doors came open and this this guy came around the corner and um he attacked me he got on top of me and you know he he actually beat me up that was my first morning in jail but oh, the wow. funny thing is um he was in there because he thought he was jesus and so my first morning in jail i got beat up by this criminally insane guy who thought he was jesus oh you know? wow yeah. How ironic is that, knowing where you are now? But we don't want to get ahead of the story. Uh, <laughs> I guess one of the things that I've heard you say in the past is that there was no rhyme or reason to their actions, so you could maybe be attacked for no reason at all. Yeah, no, no, because the people were, um, you know, they were really, really off their heads. Yeah. Really dangerous, really insane, and some very serious, serious crimes. I mean, in that place, there was no knives. When you ate, you had a spoon, and you were surrounded by um, nurses who were like bouncers. Yeah. And there was fights all the time, every day, fights. It was just so violent. Wow. There, was, there wasn't even any pens to write with, you know. Mm-hmm. To get a pen was a big occasion, a special occasion, where you'd sit down and you'd be, like, surrounded by nurses. You'd have a pen because a pen is quite a uh, bad weapon. Hmm. You know, it can be used as a weapon. But you must have been in fear twenty four seven. Yeah, I was certainly, I was certainly concerned for my life, and you, because you just never knew yeah. uh, when you were going to be attacked. And like I said, you could be attacked randomly for no reason because people who are out of their mind, they don't, you know, they're not working on reason, are they? Yeah, right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I mean, it's bad enough in a regular prison, but at least you know why someone's angry sure. with you. Yeah, that's right. Normally, you do. I actually wrote a um, a poem while I was there. I got a pen and I wrote a poem mm-hmm. and sort of described how I was feeling at the time. Can you share that with us? Sure. It goes like this. It goes, the game is over. I'll play no more. I've shut the door. There is no key. I've built a wall. Nothing will enter. I'll cease to exist. Wow. So that was the darkest of the dark period of I reckon, life. Yeah, I reckon. I didn't see much way out, you know. I didn't see any hope. But fortunately, you know, <laughs> there was a way out. I just couldn't see it at the time. There was a sliver of light that came through. How did things start to turn the corner? Yeah, well, eventually I got out. I was paroled from um, J. Ward Ararat after spending three years in maximum security um, prisons and mm-hmm. psych centers. Yep. Um, I went to live in Ballarat with my um, sister I set up a house with some pretty heavy um, criminals and I started um, selling drugs in that house um, and that's um, so you didn't go clean after being in no, prison no 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 I didn't go clean I didn't so it's really. right back to the crime and the drugs right, oh yeah well back on but on a whole new level because I knew people now I was networked because I got to know lots of different people in prison and, oh wow you know I actually I had one of those guys from Jaywood come to live with me he was a very um, serious Criminal spent, you know, 27 years in prison, killed three people, spent nine years, nine months in solitary confinement in a prison. And he was living with you? Yeah, he was living with me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I set up a house with um, some pretty heavy criminals and we started selling drugs. And um, interesting enough that one night another drug 
dealer came around our house to buy some drugs and one of our dogs bit him and he went home and he got an axe and he came back and axed the dog. And the guy who um, had done the 27 years jail, um, he had a gun and the next day he was going to go around and kill him. And I talked him out of it. I said, listen, you've done enough jail. I don't want you to go back to jail. So I made a phone call to a friend of mine in New South Wales who I knew was a hitman. I left a message on his answering machine. And I, well, obviously, I didn't say, I want you to come and kill someone. I just said, oh, I need you to come. Mm-hmm. I need to talk to you, you know? Yeah. But anyhow, about 24 hours later, he turned up at my house, and he was a different person, you know? He, yeah, he was he was um, preaching the gospel. And, like, I called him to kill someone. Yeah. And he come, uh, yeah, and he, instead of coming with a 9 mil pistol, he came with an NIV Bible, and he was <laughs> on fire for Jesus. Wow. You know? This was yeah. the, the former hitman. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I knew him from prison. Yeah, I met him in prison. He was a friend of mine. And um, I thought, you know, I wanted him to come and kill this guy. Yeah. So we could all be at a nightclub and have an alibi. And um, this guy would just disappear. But instead of killing him, I ended up going with him to New South Wales to his house. And All of a sudden, this former hitman, I mean, you, you believe that this was a hitman. He shows up. Yeah. And instead of having a pistol, he has an NIV. Yeah. And then... Why do you all of a sudden follow him back to New South Wales? Uh, um, well, I saw the difference. Well, there's a couple of things. I was searching at the time. I was looking because of my spiritual experiences in the past, you know, the demonic stuff. I, mm-hmm. I knew the spirit realm was real, and I really was searching for God, to be honest. Yeah. And I, like, I was, I, I, I was um, at the time, I, was, I said I was Buddhist. I had all these Buddhas in my room, and I, like an altar to Buddha, and... Mm-hmm. and so you were seeking sincerely, spiritually. I was. I was sincerely mm-hmm. seeking yeah. truth, you know. Yeah. Um, and I saw the difference in my friend because I knew him from prison. He was quite egotistic. He was quite proud. He was like black belt in karate, and you know, mm-hmm. he's not the sort of guy you mess with. But yeah, um, he was humble. He was gentle. He was kind, and he knew the word of God, and he shared the word with me, and it had power. And um, yeah, and when he shared the word, I. I remember one day, at one night at his house, I couldn't stop shaking. There was something in me. There was like an encounter between two kingdoms, the Mm. kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And then I realized that God was real. And and at that time, I said, oh, I want Jesus. And he actually took me in town in his little ute. We went to see a pastor in town. And I remember getting down on my knees and asking Jesus to forgive me. And, And I remember there was just like a little flash of light. And that night, I went back to his house and... Um, yeah, I was able to read the Bible for the first time in my life, which was amazing. Wow. So who would have thought? I mean, this is so bizarre. You get attacked by someone who says they're Jesus, and then you get led to the Lord by somebody who was a hitman. I mean, this is just bizarre. <laughs> yeah, I met, I met the real Jesus. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, wow. And so what happened then after that? I was in New South Wales with my friend. Mm-hmm. And I had a, an encounter with God that I could not deny. It was like it was like He wrapped His arms around me, and I could just feel His love. And hmm. it was better than any drug I'd ever experienced. Wow! Uh, you know, it, it was just amazing. Yeah. And then uh, the two of us went back to my house in Ballarat, and we started sharing Jesus. And you know, like I was, I was a new creation. I was different, and I, I was on fire for God. And I, I started preaching to the other people in my house. And two more people in my house actually came to Jesus. And one of them was that guy um, who'd done 27 years jail. He was the hardest man I've oh, ever wow. met. Yeah. And I saw him, um, as he accepted Jesus, you know, a tear come down his eyes. You know, he cried for the first time I've ever seen him cry. I you, wow. He was so tough. But, but, you know, no one's too tough for Jesus. Yeah. Jesus can reach the hardest heart. He can, he can reach anyone. Wow. He can change anyone. Wow, what an incredible story of transformation that David Harris has shared with us today. But there is much, much more to his story. So we invite you to join us again next time for part two of David chatting with Eric Scadabo about his amazing life journey. And I wish I could say that everything goes perfectly well from that point on in his life. But unfortunately, David encounters some serious struggles. And I'm sad to say he eventually goes back to prison. Fortunately, God was not through with him, and his long and winding journey continues. Once again, we'll hear how it all works out 
next time. But before we go, I want to leave you with these verses that really sum up what happened to David. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, Jesus, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Well, that same power that rose Jesus from the dead and delivered David from the kingdom of darkness is also available to transform anyone who puts their faith and trust in the Lord. If you'd like to pray with someone about being transformed and delivered from darkness, our prayer line is 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. We would love to pray for you on that number, 1-800-772-936. Well, thanks for joining us for part one of David Harris's story. Until next time, when we'll hear part two, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Next time on The Story. There was a group of about 16 guys who were um, psychologists, and there we discovered that we all had similar pain in our heart. We all had rejection and wounds from our fathers and we all had abandonment issues. It was interesting that we all had the same same stuff going on, but we probably never identified it before because we never had the opportunity to process it in such an environment. David Harris's life spiralled downward into prison cells, mental asylums and frightening experiences with the occult. But after he finally puts his faith in Jesus, he begins a new journey filled with incredible healing but also with some significant setbacks. We'll hear more of David's amazing life story next time. The Story. Just another way vision is connecting faith to life. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 